Today I want to talk about a certain way that we can take any nice function and approximate it via a rational function. That is a ratio of two polynomials. But before we look at that, I'd like to look at a more well-known way to approximate functions via polynomials. And what I'm really talking about here is Taylor polynomials. So we'll recall that the nth Taylor polynomial of a function f of x is given by the following polynomial, which I'll call t sub n of x. So it's going to be f evaluated at a plus f prime of a times x minus a. Next up would be a half f double prime of a times x minus a squared, all the way up to 1 over n factorial, the nth derivative of f evaluated at a, and then we have x minus a to the n. That's why it's called the nth Taylor polynomial, because we've got a degree n polynomial here. And then let's recall that there's some real number or non-negative real number r, so that if we're inside of the interval that has radius r based at a, then our original function is approximately equal to the nth Taylor polynomial. And that approximation gets better and better and better as n gets very, very large. And then furthermore, if we take some limits, the Taylor polynomial turns into a Taylor series. And we'll say that's the Taylor series based at a or centered at a. And in this setup, we don't just have approximate equality, we have equality. The right hand side converges to our original function. And that is if we have a nice enough original function. Now here are some like well-known common Taylor series where we base them at a. And you can simply truncate these to get Taylor polynomials of whatever degree that you want. And here we're taking a to be equal to zero if I didn't say that. So for e to the x, we get this Taylor series, which is 1 plus x plus 1 over 2 factorial x squared. The general term is 1 over n factorial x to the n. For sine of x, we have x minus 1 over 3 factorial x cubed plus 1 over 5 factorial x to the fifth. The general term is minus 1 to the n over 2n plus 1 factorial times x to the 2n plus 1. And the intervals for these first two are simply all real numbers, so we get convergence everywhere. Then 1 over 1 minus x, well that's just a standard geometric series. So we've got 1 plus x plus x squared. The general term is x to the n. The unit interval, the open unit interval that is, is our interval of convergence. Next up, for the inverse tangent, we have x minus a half x squared plus a third x cubed. The general term is minus 1 to the n plus 1 over n, x to the n. And here we get the unit interval that's open on the left and closed on the right. Okay, so now that we've recalled this polynomial method of approximation, let's jump into our rational function method of approximation. So this type of approximation is called a Pade approximation. And just to reiterate, we want to approximate our nice function by some sort of rational function. That is, on some interval, we should have f of x is approximately equal to, on the numerator, we have a sub n x to the m added all the way down a1x plus a0. In the denominator, we have b sub n x to the n added all the way down b1x plus 1. So we can always multiply the numerator and the denominator by something to turn this number into a 1. We could really put a 1 anywhere we wanted, but we might as well put it there. And this is called the m comma n Pade approximant. Now I'd like to point out that inside of this rational function, there are m plus n plus 1 total degrees of freedom, and those are those coefficients that we have. But m plus n plus 1 gives us the ability to impose m plus n plus 1 equations. And the way that makes sense to do that is to impose equality between f of x and the rational function up to the m plus nth derivative. Now why the m plus nth derivative? Well that's because we're going to impose it for the zeroth derivative, that is just the function value then the first, second, third, fourth, all the way up to the m plus nth. 
So that'll be M plus N plus one total maybe things that we're setting equal to each other are total equations and these are like our unknowns. So let's do our first example. We'll look for an approximation of e to the x where we have a quotient of linear polynomials. And I'll call this p of x, that's the rational function. Okay, so we've got three degrees of freedom. So that means we should have equality of the functions, their first derivatives and their second derivatives. So in other words, we need e to the zero to be equal to p of zero. And then we need equality of first derivatives. Well, the derivative of e to the x is simply e to the x, so that's e to the zero again, equal to p prime of zero. And then the second derivative, well, that's just gonna be e to the zero again, and p double prime of zero. So those are our three equations. So let's see what we get out of this. So e to the zero is one, and then p of zero is equal to, let's see, a zero over one. Oh, but that means that a zero is equal to one. Okay, well now let's look at this p prime of zero thing. Well again, uh, e to the zero is one, and then if we take the derivative here, we'll get a one minus b one over b one x plus one quantity squared then we need to evaluate that at x equals zero. So I just took the derivative, we have to use the quotient rule obviously. But if we set x equal to zero here, we'll get a1 minus b1. But then let's maybe put this all together. Here we'll have a1 minus b1 is equal to one. Okay, nice. But now let's maybe take a midpoint summary here. So, so far, before we impose this third condition, we have p of x is equal to, well, I'll just call this ax plus um, one over bx plus one, because we've already fixed a naught at one. And then here I'm renaming a1 and b1 just to a and b. And then those satisfy this a minus b equals one. And now let's impose this second derivative condition. So that means we need to take the second derivative of p of x. Well, again, that's just by using the quotient rule a couple of times. Here we'll get 2b times b minus a all over bx plus one quantity cubed. But now applying uh, our condition that we need this at x equals zero, that's going to simplify down to 2b times b minus a, and then we need that to be equal to one. So check it out. Now we've got two equations and two unknowns. So those are our two equations, and obviously the two unknowns are a and b. But observe if a minus b is equal to one, that means that b minus a is equal to negative one, Oh, but that means that 2b is equal to negative one. Just moving the minus sign over, meaning that b is equal to minus one half. But then if b is equal to minus one half plugged into this first equation, we'll get a is equal to one half. So that really turns our function into the following. So we have p of x is now equal to a half x plus one over minus a half x plus one. Or we might as well multiply the numerator and the denominator by two to give us x plus two over two minus x. So let's maybe fit this in the upper corner over here. We have our one comma one pot a approximate of e to the x. And this says that e to the x should be approximately equal to x plus two over two minus x on some interval containing zero, given the fact that we impose these conditions all at zero. Okay, so on the screen right now is a graph of these two functions, and as you can see, they're pretty close on that interval. Okay, let's do another example. 
Okay, so for our second example, where we're gonna find the three comma two approximate of sine, we're gonna use a different strategy. And this strategy is nice because it generalizes essentially to any nice function. So what we'll do is take sine and rewrite it using its Taylor uh, series, but we're gonna truncate that Taylor series at a degree which is three plus two. So the degree of the numerator plus the degree of the denominator. So let's see what that gives us. So what we should have here is x minus one over three factorial x cubed and then plus one over five factorial times x to the fifth should be approximately equal to our rational function which I'll just recopy now. And now what we'll do is simply cross multiply so we've got an equation of polynomials instead of an equation of a rational function on one side. So in other words, I'm gonna take the denominator up here and multiply it up to the numerator on the left-hand side. And that's gonna give us the following object. So we'll have b2 over 120 times x to the seven. That's from the leading terms on both. And then, well, let's get the rest of it copied over. Okay, so there we have it. We have it all written out. But what you'll notice is that there's no possible way to determine b2 and b1 using this setup. Or in fact, maybe there's a way to do it, but it will contradict, um, but we'll have contradictory equations. Like notice the fact that we have no degree seven thing on the right hand side means that b2 has to be equal to zero. But then this b2 minus one sixth in the x cubed part and then a, non, a possibly non-zero x cubed part here tells us that maybe b2 is not zero. So the way to do this is just to think that, hey, we're approximating this very, very close to zero. And that's because we use the Taylor polynomial of sine near zero. So that means x to the seven and x to the six are really small near zero. So we'll just kind of forget that these things are here. In other words, we're gonna ignore these top terms. Okay, great, so let's just get rid of these. And then let's see the system of equations that's built from that. So observe that this x to the fifth term has gotta be zero because there's no x to the fifth on the right hand side. So that gives us this must be equal to zero. Then this x to the fourth term also needs to be equal to zero because there's no x to the fourth term on the right hand side. And after that, we'll need a sub three to be equal to b2 minus six. And then we'll need a two to be equal to b1 because of those are the x squared terms we'll need a1 to be equal to, oh, well that just has a coefficient of one. So that means that a1 is equal to one, and then a0 must be equal to zero because there's no constant term over there on the right hand side. But observe that we're like getting values of our coefficients really quickly, so like, let's collect those. So, so far we see that a0 is equal to zero, we see that a1 is equal to one. And then from this right here, we see that b1 is equal to zero. But then look at this, b1 and a2 are the same, so that means that a2 also is equal to zero. Oh, but now let's look at this equation right here that involves b2. Well, we can easily move some things around there and we'll get a value for b2. That is b2 must be equal to one over 20. So that's just simple arithmetic. So that means we found the values of b1 and b2. Those are the only values in the denominator that we needed. And the last thing we need to find is a3. But check it out. We know that a3 is equal to b2 minus one over six. So that means that a3 is equal to one over 20 minus one over six. So you can do that calculation and you'll see that you get minus seven over 60. Okay, 
So those are all of our coefficients. So let's get those into our approximation up there. And then while we're at it, we'll clear denominators to make it look a little nicer. Okay, so there we have it. That's our three, two rational function approximation for sine. And again, I'll put an example of those plots on the screen right now so that you can see them. Now, how might this work in general? Well, let's say generally you've got a function f of x, and let's say you're allowed to take any derivatives of f of x. That is, it has a Taylor series approximation or a Taylor series expansion in some interval centered at zero. But we want to approximate it by the, one of these rational functions. So that means we want to approximate it with a quotient of a polynomial in the numerator that looks like this, and then a polynomial in the denominator that takes this form that we've been working with. Okay, great. And then, well, since we've got a Taylor series approximation, what we want is for this to be equal to, but it's not really equal to, it's approximately equal to f of zero plus f prime of zero times x plus so on and so forth. Or we could maybe write this out as the sum as n goes from zero, or I shouldn't use n here, maybe k goes from zero up to infinity of the kth derivative of f evaluated at zero over k factorial times x to the k. And then next up what we'll do is take the denominator over here on the left hand side and then this numerator on the right hand side and multiply them giving us an equation of polynomials. You might say, well, I'm gonna be left with uh, infinite series on one side, but we'll truncate that at x to the m plus n, much like we did in our example. So after multiplying those two things that have magenta parentheses, we'll have the following. And this is using the so-called Cauchy product formula for um, multiplying series. We'll have the sum as r goes from zero to m plus n. And inside of that, we'll have the sum as s goes from zero to r. We'll have the s derivative of f evaluated at zero over s factorial and then b sub r minus x times x to the r. And here, if you ever encounter a b sub zero, we'll take that to be equal to one. And then let's say if we didn't truncate it, what we would have is a upper bound here of our sum would simply be infinity. And then over here, we'll have a sub m x to the m added all the way down to a sub zero. So now let's observe that we have more terms over here on the left than we have on the right. That means that when we build our system of equations, the top bunch of system of systems of equations are equal to zero. And in fact, what we have is for r between m plus one, so r between m plus one and m plus n, we'll have this sum as s goes from zero up to r of s derivative of f evaluated at zero times s factorial times b r minus s equals zero. And then for r between zero and m, we'll have this resulting sum equal to a sub r, that rth coefficient on the right hand side. So that gives us well, a system of m plus n plus one equations and m plus n plus one unknowns. And then you can solve that using the methods of linear algebra and you'll get your appropriate rational function approximation for whatever given function you started with. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button, subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, Subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.